Hello, everybody. We're going to get started. We're very fortunate today to have Terry, uh, Carrie and Megan coming from the AIDS Committee of North Bay and Area, and I will pass it over to them to uh, introduce themselves. Um, and they are open to having you uh, interrupt them during the presentation for questions. Um, okay, I'll um, seem to be at the top. So. Um, my name is Carrie McGuire Trahan. I'm the nurse practitioner at the AIDS Committee. I've been here since uh, 2011. I did start um, as an RN treating Hep C in 2006. Um, became a nurse practitioner in uh, 2013, and and of course um, expanded my role here at the AIDS Committee. Uh, so uh, educated at Nipissing University and at um, I'll, um, Athabasca University in Alberta, and um, in my role, what, what uh, we offer here is hepatitis testing treatment education. Uh, we also do testing and education for HIV, and I do a little bit of prep uh, for some of our clients. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, um, that's me in a nutshell. Thank you. Thanks, Carrie, and thanks, Kathy, for inviting us to present today. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Megan Dudicom, and I'm the Hepatitis C Community Coordinator with the AIDS Committee of North Bay and Area. Uh, so what my role entails is working with service providers, primarily with community development, um, doing education in the community and in our surrounding area. Um, so Perry Sound's actually part of our catchment area. Um, we, get, we actually have a very large catchment area. Um, so doing education, uh, community development um, and awareness around hepatitis C. I also have experience in outreach. I was an outreach worker for a couple of years with the agency. Um, so I also have experience with that. Uh, part of my portfolio too is harm reduction. And I'm also someone with lived experience. So I actually lived with hepatitis C for a period of time. And that's actually how I got affiliated with the agency. Uh, actually, was, I was first affiliated with Carrie. Um, and I just never left. <laughs> so thank you for having us today. And yeah, with that, we'll get started. All right, so the objectives, I'm just gonna move my screen around. Okay, the objectives for today are for you to have gained knowledge of what HIV and hepatitis C are and how they affect the body. Uh, to be able to identify how HIV and hepatitis C are transmitted as well as prevention strategies, to be able to recognize risk factors for contracting or transmitting hepatitis C and HIV, to have a working knowledge of the testing and treatment processes for HIV as well as hepatitis C, and to be able to differentiate, differentiate the differences between HIV and hep C, to have gained knowledge and an understanding of the barriers to testing, treatment, and prevention for both viruses, and to be able to apply knowledge gained today of HIV and hepatitis C to individual roles in serving clients. So please keep in mind that this presentation does discuss drugs, drug use, and sexual activity. And as Kathy said, if you have any questions at any time, please feel free to interject. Um, we're happy to answer them. <clears throat> so just a few... Uh, things about some of the services we offer. So for clinical, as Carrie mentioned, uh, she does testing for hepatitis C as well as HIV. We, so Carrie's our nurse practitioner. We also have a registered nurse named Saskia, uh, both of which are able to do vaccinations for hepatitis A and B, flu shots, treatment for hep C, uh, wound care, testing for sexually transmitted bloodborne infections. And they also do a lot of counseling, just to name a few. Um, the nurses do a lot more than that on a daily basis, but those are just some of the basic services we offer, or they offer. Um, education and uh, outreach. So we have a needle syringe program here on site. So we offer a variety of harm reduction supplies uh, to reduce the transmission of HIV and hepatitis C. <coughs> Excuse me. Some of those supplies include uh, new syringes, um, crystal meth pipes, inhalation pipes. Uh, we assemble kits as well. So we'll put all the supplies needed for a certain method of smoking in the kit. So for example, we'll have safer injection kits, which will include new syringes, uh, sterile water, cotton uh, filters, tourniquets, alcohol swabs, 
basically anything you would need to safely inject a substance. Um, this also goes for inhalation. So we have inhalation kits, we have uh, safer snorting kits, um, and then we also have uh, foil kits, as we've seen an increase in folks accessing foil and inhalation pipes to smoke substances off foils. Uh, we also offer safer sex supplies, so condoms, lube, insert of condoms, um, <clears throat> dental dams. And then we also do mobile outreach. So we have two outreach workers uh, who are specifically, who specifically do mobile outreach. And then we also have three other outreach workers who rotate between doing street outreach in the community and in reach. We also have a food rescue program. Uh, we get donations from Starbucks. We, um, a previous staff member here developed a relationship with them and they've so generously donated so many sandwiches for our clients. Um, we also have a clothing drive. Uh, we do awareness events such as uh, World Hepatitis Day, which is coming up July 28th. We do anti-stigma campaigns. Um, so we've actually collaborated with the Perry Sound Health Unit on a few of those campaigns. Um, so you may be aware of a few around normalizing naloxone. Um, there's actually a research project ongoing uh, right now in Perry Sound as well around substance use and the increases in overdoses during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. We do HIV, hep C, and harm reduction education, such as what we're doing here today. Uh, naloxone training is a huge component of what we do. We do this both for people um, who want to access kits who use substances, as well as service providers, um, as well as pretty much anybody in the community who identifies under our criteria. And then we also offer clients practical support. And for our social programming, we have uh, programming specific for LGBTQ2S plus folks. Uh, safer spaces training. We have a peer program and a volunteer program. And we also have an outreach worker who conducts a community cleanup program, um, which has been hit and miss with COVID, but he's trying to get it uh, built back up. So those are just kind of a snapshot of the services we offer. And before we get into um, hepatitis C and HIV, I thought we'd do a Kahoot activity. So um, I have to stop sharing this, this power presentation to go to the KUHA activity, but the link should be in the chat, or you can even copy this link right here from this slide. And Hi. for those, oh. Sorry, Megan, I just put it into the chat for you. Thank you. For those who aren't aware of KUHA, it's a digital uh, platform uh, for learning and education, and it incorporates quizzes and games. It's just a fun and engaging way to learn and share information. Um, so what will happen is I'll walk you through it, but you need a cell phone and you do need data um, or Wi-Fi. And so basically you click on this link and it'll bring you um, to an area where you will be asked to enter a code. So I'm gonna do this with you so it's easier. Whoops. I stopped my video instead, sorry, pause. All right, so I'm gonna open this up and it's not letting me share again for some reason. Oh, there we go, okay. <clears throat> So we'll just take a moment and then it'll prompt us with instructions. <clears throat> can everyone, can you see the screen, Kathy, with the little cube box? I can, it's actually different from the screen I got when I clicked on the link. I can see it, yeah. Okay. It's cause I started, I actually started it now. So it's going to, here we go. So it's, so if you, sorry, I gave you the wrong instruction. So you have to go to www.kahoot.it. So if you take your, um, go to that website through your phone and then enter this pin, it'll prompt you to create a nickname. And then that's when we can start shortly after. So yeah, you just join at www.kahoot.it on your phone. So we have when so far. Okay. 
And so the questions while we're waiting for folks to create a nickname and join, the questions are just on HIV and Hep C. Um, there's only there's only like maybe five or ten questions, um, just basic questions to kind of get us started. I think we're just waiting for a couple more people and then we'll get started. Has everybody joined? I think I see a, some names a couple times. I don't know if that's just on, like in terms of the Zoom um, participants. Is that everyone though? Can yes. everyone see the same screen as me with Ola, VS, Sunshine, Vic, Owen, Wen? Okay. I think that's everyone. Okay. Yeah, other than maybe Amy. Okay. Maybe. Okay, well, we'll get started just uh, just being conscientious of time. So we'll get started. So on your screen, you'll see the options will be color coded and symbols um, that relate to the question, like to the answer. So I'll show you in a moment here. So you see how there's different shapes and different colors. So triangle red, square um, diamond blue. So that will be you want to choose the one that's the same on your phone, if that makes sense. So this question is hepatitis C is a virus that attacks which part of the body? So immune system, brain, liver, or central nervous system. Awesome. So everyone got it right, liver. Perfect. And it looks like everyone kind of gets the hang of it. So that's correct. Hepatitis C is a virus that attacks the liver. Once hepatitis C enters the body, it attacks the liver and damages the liver by replicating inside the liver cells. The liver is the largest internal organ that without treatment can lead to scarring of the liver. So the question number two is what body fluids is hepatitis C transmitted through? So we have saliva, semen or vaginal fluid, any physical contact or blood. So the correct answer is blood. Hepatitis C is transmitted through blood to blood contact. I should have possibly, I should have also told you folks, there is a timer. Um, so for each question, you only have a certain amount of time to answer. So question three is true or false. There is no present cure for hepatitis C. I just realized I was on mute. So, so the correct answer is yes, there is a cure for hepatitis C. There is no vaccine, but there is now a cure. So next question is what does HIV target and weaken? So in terms of the body, which uh, part of the body does it target? Awesome, so everyone got that question right. And the answer is the immune system. HIV targets and weakens the immune system by multiplying and targeting CD4 cells. Is there a cure for HIV? True or false? Or yes or no? So the correct answer is no. 
There is currently, oh, so O is in the lead with 4,264 points. And there is no uh, cure currently for HIV. However, there is treatment options available to suppress the virus and still be able to live a healthy life. True or false, there is no vaccine for HIV. So this means there is no way to protect yourself against contracting HIV. <clears throat> so the correct answer is false. Even though there's no vaccine for HIV, there are still ways uh, there are still prevention strategies, such as using condoms, uh, PrEP and PEP, which we'll talk about today, uh, using new harm reduction supplies and getting tested regularly. Which body fluid does not transmit HIV? So the correct answer is saliva. So blood, vaginal fluid, semen, rectal fluid, and breast milk are the five fluids that transmit HIV. This means you cannot contract, con contract HIV through coughing, kissing, or casual contact. And that's it. So congratulations, Vic, you're in third place. VS is in second place. And O is in first place, but you're all winners for playing. So thanks for that, for that folks. Good job. And I'm just gonna share my screen back to the presentation to get into HIV and Hep C 101. All right. <coughs> Can everyone see the screen? Yes. Okay, great. So just some facts about hep C. We're gonna talk about hep C first and then HIV next. Um, so just some quick facts is hep C is the number one bloodborne virus in Canada. It's the rate of known new, in, known new infections is five times higher than the rate of HIV. And 44% of people are unaware that they have hepatitis C. 67% of Canadians reported never being tested. And an additional 44% of Canadians reported that their most recent test was five years ago. Um, hepatitis C infections are three times higher in First Nations people living on reserve than off reserve. And we talk about this a little bit more today um, as to reasons why. <laughs> so as you learn from the game, hepatitis C is a virus that attacks the liver. However, hepatitis C is preventable and treatable, but if it is left untreated, it can lead to liver damage, liver failure, and or liver cancer. So on the left is um, an image of a healthy liver, which most of you folks have seen. Um, the middle picture is a picture of a liver that has some scarring, which is called fibrosis. Um, so over time, the virus causes inflammation of the liver, destroying healthy liver cells and causing the liver to replace them with scar tissue. So this is what happens during the process of fibrosis. And if left untreated, um, and it can progress to cirrhosis, which is where we see heavy scarring of the liver, often seen in liver disease. So hepatitis C is transmitted blood to blood. The virus gets into the blood through breaks in the skin or in, or in the lining of the nose and mouth. It's a very strong and resilient virus, unlike HIV, which um, basically dies momentarily after being exposed to the air. Hepatitis C can live outside the body for 16 hours and up to four days approximately on hard surfaces. And in the right conditions, it can live even longer in uh, syringes. And this is more like laboratory-like conditions. So this means that dried blood can also pass the virus. And people can live with hepatitis C for 20 or 30 years without feeling sick or, or having any symptoms, even though the virus is injuring the liver. 
Over time, the damage to the liver gets worse, making it harder for the organ to work properly. <coughs> So some risk factors for contracting hepatitis C, as we know, it's passed blood to blood. So sharing um, drug gear with each other. So folks that are using substances, and this is all, all sorts of drug paraphernalia, anything from syringes to pipes, um, even the spoons for injecting, filters for injecting, anywhere where there's blood present, especially when um, there's drugs involved because there's different elements that are also um, factored in, right? So when someone's uh, smoking a substance, the heat applied to the, to the pipe actually can create uh, breaks and cracks in their lips, which tends to bleed. And the, the amount of blood in the, hep in the hepatitis C, sometimes it's not even visible, the amount of blood that there is. Um, so also reusing tattoo equipment, sharing hygiene products. Mother to child uh, transmission is much lower. There's less than a 5% risk. And of course, unprotected sex, um, especially sex where there's STIs present. <clears throat> and then no risks um, are kissing, casual contact, hugging, um, eating food prepared by somebody who, who has hepatitis C or using someone's utensil, unless of course there's blood to blood contact that's able to happen. Um, using a toilet seat that someone who is hepatitis C positive use. Um, those are all no risk factors. They carry no risk, I mean. In Canada, people with living with hepatitis C are disproportionately affected by poverty, substance abuse, racism, and limited access to health care. People living on the streets often do not have access to sanitary environments for using drugs or getting tattoos and piercings. <clears throat> people in prison often do not have access to new needles, drug use equipment, or sterile tattooing equipment. And people in prison often must share personal hygiene items. <laughs> So we are seeing changes in this. There are a number of prisons in Ontario now that do have harm reduction programs, um, but it's a, they're moving very slowly. Indigenous people face the challenges of colonization, racism, and its impacts, including isolation, poverty, and the erosion of culture, which can lead some people to engage in activities that have a higher chance of passing hepatitis C. Medical practices in some countries 20 or 30 years ago Expose numerous people to hepatitis C, some of which, uh, some of whom have immigrated to Canada. It's also important to note different communities, right? Um, what we see is like more rural communities may not have as much access to health care or harm reduction supplies, particularly with First Nations communities um, and other communities that are, are more rural in the country or disconnected from urban society. That's why one of the things we do um, as an agency with outreach is we try to expand our services to reach those folks and make sure people, we try to make sure people have access to those supplies and services um, because it is very important. Unfortunately, a lot of the time, um, because our catchment area is so big, it's so hard to serve all those, all those populations of people, right? So there is a hidden population out there that aren't receiving those services. <clears throat> some common symptoms for hepatitis C vary, uh, but some physical symptoms that have been described are fatigue, uh, brain fog, so having a hard time concentrating, um, just feeling, uh, you know, nauseous, having itchy skin or a rash, dark colored urine. Some people experience flu-like symptoms, which is why they may not even realize they're sick, they have hepatitis C and may just mistake it for a cold or another virus. <clears throat> Some people experience weight loss, um, jaundice, even abdominal pain, particularly in the liver area. And then, of course, there's the psychological and emotional symptoms as well, such as depression, anxiety, uh, stress, low sex drive, internalized and externalized stigma. And then there's always the fear of disclosure, um, as well as exposure, and of course, shame. Um, it's important to note that having certain symptoms, even if it's multiple of symptoms, does not automatically mean that a person does have hepatitis C, um, as it does vary for folks. So before we move into testing, does anyone have any questions about the transmission of hepatitis C risk factors um, or how hepatitis C affects the body? And is there anything you want to add, Carrie, before we move on to testing? 
Hello? No. Um, oh, sorry. I think somebody had a question. I have a question. Hello? Uh, yeah, Hello, sorry. Go ahead. I just wanted if you can please clarify the one about um, five times prevalence uh, between um, uh, First Nations. Is, are you saying uh, First Nations who live on reserve have five times more prevalence than the population in general or versus uh, just First Nations who live in, in cities? Um, yeah, so it's actually three times. So the fact was uh, First Nations people living on reserve have three times, uh, hold on a second. It's three times higher, there are three times higher rates in First Nation, Nations people living on reserve than off reserve. Thank you. You're welcome. And that's just to kind of emphasize the fact of a lack of services, right? A lack, of, not a lack of services necessarily, but a lack of access. Um, the only thing I was going to add is if you're working as a family uh, practitioner, um, it's, it's easy to order a hep C antibody test to check. Uh, I've been treating a very long time and I'm always surprised at the number of people um, who will tell me that they've had symptoms for years that nobody could figure out. And finally, someone tested them for hep C and it has given them some answers. So the fatigue and nausea are the big ones. Um, so, you know, it can be bad enough that um, folks um, who are afflicted can't uh, perform their uh, activities of daily living. They have a hard time going to work. They have a hard time raising their children, um, being active members of society. So. Um, it's important. If you take everyone on the planet who has either Hep B or Hep C, it equals one in twelve. So chances are, if you have a practice, you have some. You may not even know. Yeah, and I think often too, like like we said, especially if someone's using substances, they may not even realize they're having these symptoms, right? Like they just may think that it's it's part of the lifestyle or it's an effect of the yeah. substance they're using, or because they don't have that substance, right? And it's not just people who use substances that are at risk of hepatitis C, and we talk more about that, but it can affect anyone, right? That's right. Um, so testing is the only way to find out if you have hepatitis C. So there are two tests. The first test is called an antibody test, and this would be the screening test. If this test comes back positive, then the person would take what's called an RNA test, and that's the test that confirms if the person has a current infection. <clears throat> A fiber scan will also tell us how much damage is being done to the person's liver as a result of the hep C virus. Um, so the process around that is once someone's tested, so someone like myself, I had hepatitis C at one point in my life, I will always test positive for the antibody test, right? Um, so if I did want to, um, if I was re-exposed or reinfected, then I believe I would go right to the second test, right, Carrie, the RNA test. <laughs> Right. That's right. So once you have a positive antibody, don't bother um, ordering it again. You'll always get a positive. Perfect. And so uh, the process for testing is if someone is confirmed, so they do receive um, a positive RNA test. So the, the antibody test, sorry, I should say first is um, there's a point of care test that we call it, and it's a quick prick to your finger. So the picture um, on the screen is what the antibody test looks like. So it's a prick to the person's finger and the results are usually available within give or take 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and during that point, like the health professionals such as Carrier or yourselves or whomever would sit down with the person and talk about the process and, um, and the outcomes if their uh, test is positive. Did you wanna to add to that, Carrier? Um, no, you're, you're back oh, on. I thought you took your mic off to add, okay. No, I just took it off. Okay. Um, so if once that's confirmed, um, if the person is positive, then they would get lab blood work done for a, for a full liver workup in order to go on treatment. So that would be include a full set of labs, um, which is done to rule out any other sources of hepatitis and co-occurring um, hepatitis B infection. And then for the ultrasound, um, this would also be done, as I mentioned, to assess how much damage is being done to the liver. And then at that point, uh, the person would consult with a specialist and then choose to get on treatment. 
Does anyone have any questions about how the testing process works for hepatitis C? I, sorry, I was just curious, um, lab-wise, what all would you be ordering? Like your standard yeah. ALT, your ferritin, your Billy? Yeah. Uh, CBC, uh, yeah, kidney panel, liver panel. Um, we, uh, I always check for um, uh, diabetes at that point. Um, if it's female, uh, before we do um, treatment of pregnancy test, of course, um, A and B uh, immune status, HEP A and HEP B immune status, um, IgA, IgG, IgM, uh, anti mitochondrial, I don't anti mitochondrial antibody, anti smooth muscle, um, HEP C RNA, and an HIV, uh, along with um, uh, syphilis, PDRL. Amazing. Thank you. You're welcome. If anybody wants a copy of those labs, um, I can, um, if you reach out by email, I can send that. And these are all based on current um, uh, guidelines. Thanks, Carrie. And I was just going to say that's why Carrie's here, because I would not be able to answer that question. <laughs> I'm not a medical professional, so um, I appreciate it. <laughs> Um, so approximately 25% of people infected with hepatitis C will be able to fight it off with their own immune system. Um, this is known as an acute infection. And if this is going to happen, it usually happens within the first six months of infection. And then approximately 75% of people infected with hepatitis C uh, will not be able to fight it off on their own. So this is known as a chronic infection. And then at that point, the person, um, you know, has the right to choose whether they want to live with it for the rest of their life or get treatment. Um, most people do opt out for opt in for treatment now because it's so effective. It's easy to take um, compared to the older treatments, which were much more harsh on the body. <clears throat> so to get into treatment. Um, so there is a cure for hepatitis C. Today, treatments cure more than 95% of people with hepatitis C. The best way to prevent worsening the liver and complications of cirrhosis is to get treated, uh, tested and treated for hepatitis C. Even people who are still using substances have the right to be offered treatment and can still be cured of the virus. Um, the older standard treatment for hep C, uh, as I just mentioned, was a combination of two medications that caused more severe, uh, more impactful side effects. And um, one of them is no longer being used. Treatment options for hepatitis C have changed a lot in the last few years. So now we have drugs called direct acting antivirals um, that are now available. And as I mentioned, they're easier to take, uh, they have fewer side effects and are taken for a short amount of time. Plus they cure more people than the older previous hepatitis C treatments. Um, and this, as I, the side effects are pretty minimal, um, such as nausea, tiredness, headache and diarrhea. And they're usually mild to moderate and go away um, or get better after a few weeks of treatment. And a lot of people don't even have any side effects. Yeah, go ahead, Carrie. I was just going to add um, uh, studies indicate side effects are equal to placebo. Um, so I, I can't remember the last uh, client we had who called and complained about a side effect. So uh, unlike the old treatment, which was horrible. So right now we're using Epclusa and uh, and or map uh, well or Ma maverick so Eplusa is one pill once a day for um, 12 weeks and maverick is three pills that you take all at once uh, every day for eight weeks um, and we do have a cleanup drug that is available if you're one of the unlucky five percent of people who uh, don't respond we have a cleanup drug um, there will be no other new drugs coming out. Um, R&D has um, um, feels that they've, they've cured, they've conquered this disease. So that's what we use. Thanks, Carrie. And so 12 weeks after the end of treatment, that's when the uh, one last test is done um, to make sure the virus is gone from the body. And that's when we know someone's been cured. And it is possible to get reinfected. So once someone is cured, um, they can definitely get reinfected if they expose themselves again. And at that point, um, 
I, I don't know if I, you can answer this, Carrie, that if treatment options would affect them any differently if they needed to take the same treatment again? Uh, well, it depends. Um, so if it was, um, if they went through treatment and they didn't clear, then we would offer them the cleanup drug. Um, if they were reinfected, we, we do an RNA again, and they'll tell us um, at that point, usually we want to know if um, they have a different genotype. We don't really rely on genotypes anymore, but it does um, let us know if they've been reinfected. Um, a lot of times clients who go through treatment don't come back for that follow-up test. A lot of them are afraid. And so it is not unusual that we have someone show up um, who has um, hep C um, viral load. They tell us they've been treated in the past, but they weren't um, tested. So what we do is we do the, the viral load and the genotype. And if they had genotype one when they were originally treated and they still have genotype one, we often count that as a, a treatment failure. If it's a genotype three, well, then we know they, they've been probably, they were reinfected. So um, the Ministry of Health will only pay for one retreatment if, um, if someone has reinfected, but there are always ways. It's, um, I've been doing this for a very long time. I've never seen someone um, who has been declined a second chance or third chance. But that's where the harm reduction education comes in, right? So if they're still using, um, then we, we spend a lot of time on harm reduction techniques so that they're not reinfected. Awesome. Thanks, Carrie. Um, and for those, uh, for folks who don't know what the genotype is, it's, it's basically a strain of hepatitis C. So there's different strains for hepatitis C, um, the most common one being genotype 1, correct? One, two, and three are common in Canada, but I think the most common one uh, from understanding is genotype one. And so uh, folks can also have different uh, strains at the same time. <laughs> so in terms of pain for treatment, uh, previously, the more liver damage you had, the sooner you would qualify for treatment under many financial support programs. This meant that many people uh, would have to wait long periods of time before they would qualify for treatment. Basically, if you didn't have um, a certain amount of liver damage, you wouldn't qualify. However, as of February 2018, all restrictions for the treatment of hepatitis C have been lifted. So what this means is once um, healthcare professionals have two lab confirmed viral loads six, month, six months apart, so those two tests, uh, the um, antibody test and the RNA test, or um, six months apart, we are able to offer, you or, or you are able to offer Ontarians treatment. So many people will not have to pay out of pocket. These are, there are programs available to cover the cost of treatment. As Carrie said, she's never had someone not be able to get treatment. And most people don't cover out of their own pocket because it is still pretty expensive. Um, however, it's not as expensive as it used to be. So some examples of uh, programs are private health insurance. There are also um, OD, so Ontario Drug Benefit Program, publicly funded programs, uh, non-insured health benefits for First Nations people, uh, Trillium in Ontario, <coughs> drug manufacturer patient programs, and there are also programs run by the federal government for specific groups. So most people will fall under one of those categories and those who don't, um, as Carrie said, there's always other ways um, in working with a healthcare professional to find different avenues because those are not all of them. Those are just the main ones. Um, so setting patients up for treatment. <clears throat> so it's important to make sure someone's stable and feeling supported if they want to access treatment. So if someone, uh, just for an example, if someone is uh, transient, they don't have any housing, they're homeless, and they're kind of all over the place, the treatment may not be a priority for them, right? So as a team, that's what we're here for is to help people, um, <coughs> you know, uh, get all those things in place. And if they decide to take treatment, then they're in a more stable place, right? So things like housing, how's their food security? Do they have food? Do they have access? Um, do they have an income? What's their social supports like? You know, getting people set up with counseling because that's an important piece of the treatment process. Um, their health and well-being, stability, and ultimately is empowering the, the patient or the client um, to be an advocate in their own health care. We uh, want to respect that they may not want treatment or they may not be ready at the time. 
again, I said, especially if their life circumstances don't reflect, um, you know, readiness to take treatment. So we'll help get people set up. That's part of our job as a team. Um, yeah, because we want to make sure people are successful, right? We don't want to set people up and not have the proper supports in place. So that's it for hepatitis C. Um, again, this is just a hep C 101 basics. Um, this isn't meant to be super thorough and in-depth because we don't have um, plenty of time. So are there any questions around hep C before we jump into HIV? Do you have anything you want to add, Carrie? Um, no, no, uh, no. Carrie, when you're doing screening, um, uh, are you using the uh, like the Life Labs or OHIP form and checking off either acute or chronic, and then add that, or do you just select the test you want specifically? And like, because uh, I sometimes am just ordering the hepatitis B surface antigen antibody, hepatitis C uh, mm -hmm. antigen for screening, because then. I wasn't quite sure what I was getting when I check off acute versus chronic and then the B versus C. And I was just wondering what your approach is to using those forms. Okay, well, we generally, we have boxes of um, point of care tests. So we tend to do a, an a okay. antibody test here, but you, yeah, you can just check it off for antibody. The RNA, there's a specific form um, that you have to fill out. But if you're uh, doing like a, a screening test or looking at, into vague, vague symptoms, are you checking off the chronic or the acute? The chronic, yes. Chronic. So we, we really can't do anything with acute. We can't get coverage for it. So basically we let it, we let the body do its thing. Um, if, the, if the individual is able to self-clear, great. Once it's chronic, then we will treat. And it, it's eight weeks. It's it's easy peasy. Um, so yeah, so we do the chronic hepatitis and then the immune status A and B and then C as well if you wanted to do that. That's great. Now the public health form for the RNA. Um, it's uh, trying to see if there's a number on here. Um, yeah, so it's um, F C um, H E zero three six zero one zero. If you want, I, if you, um, send, um, now I put my uh, email down. If you want to send me an email, I'll happily send you an entire package so that you can. You have all. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks Owen and Carrie. Are there any more questions? There, I was going to add, there are 16 hep C teams in Ontario. We're all connected. Uh, we also work very heavily with um, Katie, which is the Canadian AIDS Treatment Information Exchange. Um, if you have a question about hep C or HIV or um, such um, bloodborne diseases, they are your, they're your go-to. Um, very well researched, very knowledgeable group. So they're part of the Ministry of Health um, Hep C teams. Um, if you have questions, uh, if you have concerns uh, a month from now, um, you can reach out to any of those teams. So if you have a client who, let's say, is moving to London or Ottawa, you can connect them uh, with a team in that area and it will be very seamless. And again, if you have any questions six months from now, reach out to us. Good point. Thanks, Carrie. And I do actually have the link for Katie's website at the end of the presentation. Um, yeah, they're, they're amazing. And that's Katie with a C. <laughs> All right, we'll jump into HIV. Um, so HIV stands for Human Immunodeficiency Virus. And what it does is it targets and weakens the immune system. Um, it attaches, it attacks the CD4, the white blood cells, and it, multipl it multiplies. So it takes control of its DNA, uh, replicates inside the cell, and then releases new copies into the blood. Presently, HIV is not curable. However, there is treatment available to maintain it and live a healthy life. 
So this is just to give you an idea of the life cycle of HIV. Um, so it enters the body and attaches itself to the CD4 cells. And then it makes copies of itself, creating more of the virus. Um, in the process, it's damaging the white blood cells or the CD4 cells. And then at that point, young HIV leaves the cells and they grow into mature uh, HIV and HIV cells and goes off to attach, it, attach itself to more HIV cells, or sorry, more uh, white blood cells. When left untreated, HIV infects the white blood cells and other types of cells in the body, and it uses these cells to make millions of copies of itself, which then go on to affect other cells. So this process is called viral replication, and eventually it damages your immune system, lowers your white blood cell count, and leaves you vulnerable to serious infections and diseases. So in left, un, if left untreated, it can turn into AIDS, um, but we do have treatment options for HIV today, um, which I'll talk about shortly. And so as we talked about a little bit in the game, HIV is transmitted through five body fluids. That includes anal fluid, vaginal fluid, uh, blood, semen, and breast milk. <clears throat> now in terms of testing for HIV, it's a little bit different than hep C. Um, so there's two main ways that we test for HIV. Um, the standard testing, is a blood draw and it's sent to the lab and the results are available within a couple of weeks. <clears throat> and then there's also point of care testing, um, which again is a prick to the finger. It's the same concept as the point of care testing for hep C. Um, and you are tested and you get your um, results immediately. Um, it's estimated that 21% of people living, with HIV, uh, people living with HIV in Canada are unaware of their status. So the earlier the diagnosis, the better chance to improve and maintain long-term health. Once diagnosed, people are more likely to take steps to protect partners from acquiring HIV as well. Testing is the gateway to care, treatment, and support. And it's important to note that in Canada, HIV and hepatitis C are reportable diseases. Uh, so positive tests are reported to the local public health authorities. <coughs> Excuse me. And so uh, there's different methods of testing. So the nominal uh, identifying slash name-based test is when an HIV test is ordered using a person's name. And if the test is positive, the result is reported to public health authorities using the person's name. Um, the test result is also recorded in the healthcare records of the person being tested. So another test is the non-nominal uh, slash non-identifying test which is almost the same as the nominal identifying test, except rather than using the person's name, um, they'll use a code or initials um, to order the test. And if the test is positive, the results are still reported to the public health, uh, public health using the person's name, um, but it, it varies per province. And then test results are also recorded in the healthcare record of that person. And then there's anonymous testing, um, which offers the highest degree of confidentiality for the person being tested. So this type of test, the person does not have to give their name and the test is done using a code that is not at all linked to the person's identity. And if the test is positive, the lab does notify public health that there was a positive test. Um, however, the name and contact info is not shared and not recorded on that person's health record. Now, from my understanding, Carrie, does that the anonymous testing has to be requested though, right? It's not offered. No, it has to be requested and we actually don't do it here. Um, does the health unit do it? The health unit I believe, I believe does. So. Um, there's several clinics in Toronto that do them. It's just if it's anonymous then you're, you're missing that ability to link them to care. And uh, in, in Canada, we must have explicit, informed, and voluntary consent to conduct either HIV or hepatitis C test. Um, HIV test is voluntary in Canada. A person is free to accept or refuse an HIV test without threat or coercion. Um, to be able to provide informed consent, the person must be able to understand the advantages and disadvantages of HIV testing, interpret the meaning of the test results, and understand how HIV can be transmitted. And so this um, cycle here is just to show 
get, give you an idea of, of uh, the process for that. And we talked a little bit about this earlier, um, but just for a visual, so someone's given a point of care test, um, either for hep C or HIV, along with pre-test counseling. And then if they receive a confer confirmatory, confirmatory test, um, the results go to public health um, while you, and the results usually take, uh, sorry, not the results, the lab goes to public health and the results usually take a couple weeks. Um, if the diagnosis is positive, um, well, post-test counseling happens either way, but at that point, that person would be linked to treatment and support. And if it's negative, the person would still be linked to treatment and support, uh, especially pre for prevention strategies and harm reduction approaches. And then of course, engaging in um, that patient in the continuum of care is very important. As Carrie said, fortunately, many uh, folks get lost somewhere in this cycle, whether it be between the first test and the second test or between receiving the results or getting linked to care, um, which is why it's important to engage that patient, right? And make sure they have the supports they need to stay engaged. Um, it takes a whole team sometimes, right? Like here at the AIDS committee, we have a whole team to make sure we keep people engaged in the continuum of, continuum of care and that they do have access to treatment supports throughout the whole process. I was also going to add, um, if you're talking um, to your clients about uh, HIV testing, uh, or if you're sitting with them to give them uh, a positive, uh, it's important that you you stress it's not a death sentence anymore. We, you know, with with um, um, uh, antivirals that we use now, it puts them into remission, which we'll talk about shortly. Um, and they, the, the, now the standard um, is uh, someone with uh, treated HIV uh, will, will live uh, their, their natural lifespan. So, um, because people can get pretty upset uh, when they hear they have HIV. And a lot of, you know, we're in the medical field, we keep up with things, but uh, the general public may have a very different view of what HIV means. And uh, so um, we, we really st uh, strive to make sure that they understand this is treatable. We're gonna, you know, you're gonna, it'll put it into remission. You go about living your happy little life, so. Yeah, exactly. There's still um, a lot of stigma that exists with HIV as well as hepatitis C. Um, which actually segues into the next slide um, and creates ba barriers to testing, right? Um, so there is many barriers to testing and, oops. So the common barriers that a person can experience that will make it difficult for them to access hepatitis C testing. So the three levels of barriers to hep C, hepatitis C testing include at the individual level. So for the person who's receiving the test, um, the service provider level and the system level barriers which are caused by the structure of the healthcare systems or its services. And these barriers may increase the chance of someone being lost to follow up and not receiving their test example. So for example, at the individual level, um, some barriers may be confidentiality. So the fear of uh, things not being confident, uh, confidential. Um, having a positive test too is also a barrier, right? As Carrie mentioned, it's um, even though there is treatment for HIV and a cure for hepatitis C, it's still a scary thing to experience, to be told that you're positive uh, for HIV or hep C. Social repercussions such as stigma, stigma and discrimination, a lack of knowledge and risk of exposure, and of course, access. So operating hours of services that offer testing, um, the location of those testing sites, as well as capacity. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, some service provider barriers to testing are um, lack of knowledge of hepatitis C and HIV testing, such as where to get tested or how testing works, um, competing priorities. So trying to, um, you know, balance other priorities um, and other responsibilities and uncomfortable talking to clients about past or current risky behaviors, especially if you don't have that rapport with someone, it could be a very um, awkward, you know, experience for both parties. And then system level level barriers uh, include, but are not limited to the need to attend multiple appointments for diagnosis. So folks, some folks have a hard enough time getting to one appointment, right? They may not want to come back for multiple appointments, or there may be long wait times, um, limited operating hours, limited language options, um, and of course, criminalization around HIV. Before I talk about uh, treatment, is there any questions about barriers to testing, 
or the testing process or anything regarding HIV. I was going to add that we do have a van, we do travel. So if anybody was ever interested in having a testing event um, um, for you know, um, uh, an agency um, or a place of employment, um, we're happy to do that. Absolutely. So for HIV treatment, um, there's antiretroviral therapy, also called ART, and this involves taking a combination of drugs every day to keep the person healthy. Although many people just take one pill once a day, that pill contains several different drugs. And what those drugs do is they suppress the amount of HIV in the blood. So it does not cure HIV, um, but it does treat the virus and main, um, suppresses the viral load. So these treatments are effective, they're safer and easier to tolerate and have fewer side effects than previous medications. Um, so when HIV first uh, was discovered, it was, a, uh, I think, maybe 10 or like a lot of medications the person would have to take. Um, and they had more severe side effects on the body, uh, similar to hepatitis C. However, we do have those medication, new medications available that can greatly lower the risk of HIV transmission from an HIV positive mother to her baby during pregnancy and childbirth, allowing HIV positive women to have healthy pregnancies and give birth to HIV negative ba babies. And so what antiretroviral retroviral therapy does for people who are HIV positive is it allows them to live full and healthy lives. The goal of treatment is to achieve and maintain an undetectable viral load. So an undetectable viral load, AKA U equals U, um, is, is achievable for people living with HIV who take um, treatment, so ART, and who achieve and maintain an undetectable viral load, that what this means is they have no risk of transmitting HIV sexually. <laughs> so an undetectable viral load is less than 40 to 50 copies per milliliter and cannot be detected by standard test. So how this happens is if someone's HIV positive and they get on treatment and they adhere to treatment, and take it consistently. Um, usually I can take up to six months before they can achieve an undetectable viral load. And so uh, regular viral load testing is the only way to know if viral loads are undetectable. So at least two consecutive undetectable results over a six month period are required before U equals U can be used as a prevention strategy. An undetectable viral load does not prevent the transmission of other sexually transmitted infections. Um, so HIV is a long, lifelong infection, um, and treatment is a lifelong commitment, but what undetectable equals untransmittable provides is the relief and the knowing that you cannot uh, pass it on sexually if you achieve that. Does anyone have any questions about that, about uh, U equals U, or about the antiretroviral <laughs> anti therapy? a lot of information to take in. So um, I know Kathy, I'm going to be sending the PowerPoint to Kathy. So please feel free to look over the information and also visit the Katie website. Um, <clears throat> I added a quote in here from Dr. Laura Waters, who's the chair of the British HIV Association. Um, and she said, U equals U has transformed how we think about HIV. People with HIV can be confident there is zero risk to their sexual partners. So as Carrie said, it's no, it's no longer um, a, you know, a death sentence. There is treatment. People can live and maintain healthy lives. And it's changed. Uh, it, it's a revolution, right? People can have sex with their partners knowing they're not transmitting the virus. Um, you know, the only downside of this is there's still information ongoing about the other body fluids, right? So um, in terms of uh, blood and breast milk, there's still research ongoing around that. Um, although an undetectable viral load on therapy reduces the risk from breastfeeding, it does not reduce the risk to zero. So there have even been cases where babies have become HIV positive from breastfeeding, even when their mother has had an undetectable viral load, but there's still research ongoing. And if we look at where we are today, compared to where we were at 20 years ago, there's been a lot of transformations. Um, so it's changed a lot of lives. 
And so prevention and intervention. So you may have heard Carrie uh, mention PrEP, and I also talked about it um, in the game. So PrEP stands for pre-exposure prophylaxis. And what this means, it's a medication that HIV negative people who are at high risk for HIV transmission can take uh, to dramatically lower their risk. So they would take this medication prior to exposure. It involves taking Medicaid, oh, I just said that, um, and they would continue taking it afterwards. So when used as prescribed, it is extremely rare for an HIV negative person to become HIV uh, positive when using PrEP. So that's a prevention strategy. And then there's PEP, which stands for post-exposure prophylaxis. And this is more of an intervention strategy. Um, so this is the use of antiretroviral drugs. So it's a combination of three drugs after an exposure to HIV. And this helps to reduce the risk of HIV transmission. So this drug works by per, um, helping to prevent replication of the HIV virus once it's made its way into the body. <clears throat> And it can reduce the HIV transmission by over 80% when used consistently and correctly. Um, so this medication must be started within 72 hours of possible exposure to HIV, and it can be accessed at the hospital. And so this would be um, used in a case, for example, um, you know, a sexual assault. If someone isn't sure if they've been exposed to HIV or not, they would go to the hospital and, and access this medication. Um, also accidental exposure, if someone's pricked by a needle, um, we had a staff member a couple years ago that had that, um, that uh, experience, so they had to go to the hospital to access PEP. Um, so it's a great medication. However, there are some challenges with it as well. Um, one of the points our, nurse, our uh, registered nurse Saskia brought up is that there are challenges uh, finding funding to cover after that 72 hours because PEP does need to be taken for 28 days. And so people um, have hard, had difficulty trying to find coverage for that. And so I can't speak too, too much to that point, but um, that's just something to note in terms of barriers to accessing the medication. <clears throat> um, so I'm conscious of time and we're almost done. So just a couple more slides. Um, so why is disclosing HIV status so challenging? So, with, uh, with HIV, there's, there's a lot of challenges folks face in disclosing their status, especially when it comes to criminalization. So it is slightly different than hepatitis C. Um, you know, it can jeopardize someone's immigration status. Uh, there's fear of rejection from potential partners. Folks may fear uh, violence or other abuse. It can be a barrier to employment or fear of losing employment. Um, impact on family, friends, or dependents, uh, fear of breaching confidentiality, fear of judgment from healthcare, and just, I think, in general, confusion, right? There is a lot of information around HIV and criminalization and when someone needs to disclose legally and when they don't have to. Um, and then there's the whole other aspect of U equals U, right? What if someone has undetectable viral load? So there's a lot of information around it, and that's why it's so important for people who are HIV positive to be connected to healthcare and be connected to those supports and have an understanding of what HIV is and supports and harm reduction approaches, um, because it can be a very complicated, intimidating process, right? And so the last thing we want to do is lose those, lose those people in, in that process. We want to keep them engaged and informed. Um, so some considerations for healthcare providers. Um, so education and awareness, right, is taking that time to educate people about HIV and Hep C, especially those who are doing tests or do become positive, um, and awareness of it ourselves. Um, ensuring access to prevention and intervention strategies, such as harm reduction supplies, uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis, so PrEP, PEP, um, you know, safer sex supplies, you know, even for uh, mothers who are HIV positive, there's a there's a formula program. I think it's based out of Toronto for free formula, right? If they're not able to breastfeed, because formula is very very expensive, um, so that can be a barrier, right? So just thinking about things like that, um, encourage regular testing and checkups, support through the cascade of care, and challenging and tackling stigma. Did you want to add to that, Carrie? 
Um, no, I, well, the only thing I was going to say is if your client is on um, OW or ODSP, um, uh, breast milk sub, sub, uh, substitutes are automatically covered for 12, 12 months. That's awesome. I did not know that. That's amazing. Okay, already. So that's the end of the presentation. Um, there are some links here uh, where and references to where I got my information, as well as some good websites to learn more about HIV and hepatitis C. So Katie's on there as well. Um, does anyone have any questions? or even comments or experiences, you wanna share anything? All right, well, if that's it and folks don't have anything they wanna share or ask, um, we'll just wrap up with saying thank you so much for your time. I hope that you took something from this presentation um, that you can apply either to your personal life or your professional life. And as Carrie said, if anyone's ever interested in doing a testing drive, please reach out to us. Um, feel free to share my information, Kathy, with folks, as well as Carrie, if you're okay with that too. Oh, absolutely. And, um, and yeah. We're here to support. Exactly. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, ladies. That was excellent. Thank I know you. I, it was uh, certainly helpful for me to review all that information. So thank you. And on behalf of the medical staff, uh, we thank you for this uh, very in-depth uh, uh, presentation. Well, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, have a great afternoon and uh, rounds will resume in September. Thanks. Well, give Thanks us so a much. holiday. Eh? <laughs> yes. Holiday. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Have a great weekend. And feel free to reach out anytime, Kathy. Oh, you know I will. <laughs> and I'll send you, I'll email you the presentation shortly. <laughs>